So, um, you know, I, I told Peter, I said, uh, to slot me in to do this presentation later uh, date because uh, sometimes I think you guys are probably going to get bored of me talking. You know, I drone on about all kinds of stuff. So, you know, recently I, uh, um, recently I got a, a CNC machine. Peter, you know, twisted my rubbery arm. And I went out and I got the, what's it called, uh, Peter? The Sane Smart 3015 or something like that? Uh, yeah, and so we got that. Uh, Sane Smart, Smart, yeah. Yeah, and it's a small desktop. It's a Groover. Yeah, it's a small desktop. 30, 3018. Yeah, it's a small desktop uh, CNC machine. And uh, it does all kinds of things. And one of the things you're seeing is a lot of people milling PCB boards uh, on these so I you know I've been milling a lot of PCB boards and uh, it's not as you know there's a, a lot to it and it's not as easy or it's not as simple as everyone makes it out so I thought I'd just share my experience about the uh, CNC machine I call it the good the bad and the uh, the ugly so just you know in summary you know if you're going to take away this is what you should take away today so you, you're seeing a lot of people doing cnc machines here if you listen to to solder smoke you'll hear that pete giuliano talk about his most expensive cnc machine he got from his son because he paid for his son's uh, college education and uh, he got a cnc machine out of that can you guys hear me okay Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so, yeah, no problem. Okay, so um, the right now today, you know, it's fairly inexpensive to fabricate, uh, uh, get a PCB from from a uh, fabrication house, a PCB fab house, and you know, a lot of them now they'll even populate the parts as long as you put in, like for example, DigiKey part numbers, they'll go and they'll populate the boards uh, for you, and it's relatively inexpensive. So if you compare the cost of a, like a typical PCB fab house versus milling, the PCB fab house is much, much cheaper. You get five boards for the cost of 12 bucks Canadian. You know, um, so a CNC mill all in, you're going to end up spending about 550 bucks all in. So if you look at that, for that cost, you could do 45 PCB boards from a, from a fab house, like for example, a JLC PCB, that's 45 boards, that's a lot, you know? Now the the benefits of a CNC, you know, you know, take, take it uh, as I see it, this is my uh, perspective, looking at the world through my, my goggles, is number one, it's faster. So if you have to go to a fab house, you know, you're gonna probably be waiting two plus weeks to get a board coming in and that's with the cheapest shipping rate. You know, you could get a fast turnaround time, but you're gonna be ending ending up paying 40, 50 bucks to get five boards. So, you know, and as if you're planning to use a CNC mill for milling other work, milling metal or plastic or wood, then it makes sense to make the investment. So if you want rapid prototyping, you know, CNC mills, def definitely a, w a way to go. However, you know, that doesn't negate doing um, Manhattan or dead bug. All those mechanisms are still the cheapest way to go. And, you know, they're probably a better way to go than a CNC mill. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm just going to go over the process. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of my talks is not a tutorial on the milling process. I'm just going to talk about the the uh, process. Then I'm going to talk about the, the limitations. And then I'm going to talk about what my recipe is to mill a board uh, successfully. And then a bunch of miscellaneous stuff, which we're going to talk about. So um, is my screen refresh coming up okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so so basically, whether you're doing it for a fab house, you're generating a PCB for a fab house, 
while you're generating it for a mill, you have to use a package such as KiCad or uh, Dip Dip Trace. Um, now, if KiCad, I'm not going to go through how to generate a PCB or generate a schematic. Go back to Wayne's presentation he did uh, a year or two ago. Very good presentation where he walks you through how to generate a schematic. And he, so go back to that and, and you'll see how to generate a schematic PCB. But the exact same process you use for generating that PCB and generating the Gerber files is the exact same process you do for the mill. The exact same process. Um, except when you generate the PCB, you have to set the um, clearances for how much space you want between traces and all that stuff. The Fab House is going to give you published clearances that you need to go and program in into your your uh, PCB program and for the mill you'd have to go and put in your own custom spacing depending on the type of bit and we'll go through some of that in a subsequent slide so once you get your Gerbers you generate your Gerber files which you'd either send to the PCB fab house or you'd use for the mill you then have to use a program such as uh, Flatcam which takes that PCB Gerber file and it generates G-code. And G-code is what drives a CNC machine or it drives a, um, a mill. Uh, can you guys mute your mics, please? So Flatcam, you know, generates that G-code. I've got a definition of what G-code is here. And that's just the instructions uh, that tells it how to move. Like, for example, G00 is one code that tells it to move. To a certain X and Y location, and and uh, G00 is another code, and it just sends all these codes. And Flatcam generates something called a geometry, and from that geometry, you set your your you know, milling parameters: how deep you want the bit to go, number of passes you want it to go, and it's doing something called isolation. Right? So and from that it generates the G-code and G-code is telling it where to go and move. And it's giving it the sequence of steps to go and move. And here you can see the passes. If you zoom in on this with the red line, you'll see where all the various passes that it's going to make. So once you've, once you've got your, your G-code, then at that time you now need to send that G-code to the mill. Okay, so at that point, you, you take your PCB, you stick it to the, um, um, the, the mill, and you tape. A lot of people use double-sided tape. Some people use clamps, and you clamp it down. And then you, you do something called um, uh, a height map. So all this is done in an open source program called Candle. Th this, that's one milling program that takes that uh, G-code and sends it to the mill. There's uh, lots of others. It, uh, it's got some kind of uh, issues with, with it, but it works for, for me, uh, for uh, what I do. But it's pretty, some of the other programs could do a lot more. But it basically takes that G-code, and uh, then you do what's called a height map, and it goes around, it probes the surface, and it shows you the height of the copper is, because that copper board is not perfectly flat. So, you know, the bit might plunge down to a certain depth, and that depth might be much lower and may even miss the board completely, or the board might be higher, and it may plunge too deep in, into the board. So that's why you do a height map, and it adjusts uh, how deep it's going to plunge that bit. And, then, and at that point, once you marry the G-code and the height map together, you hit the start button and the, the mill starts. And here's a little example of doing a height map. Now what you can't see here is there's electrical connection. There's an alligator clip behind this bit. You can't see it, but you have to solder a piece of uh, um, copper to the board 
and attach an alligator clip and then you attach another alligator clip to this um, spindle and it goes down and once it hits the board it makes electrical connection and it knows that's the height it knows how far it needs to plunge down to hit the surface and then here's a little sample of it milling <laughs> And you can see as it's milling, you're seeing the little debris it leaves, which is very, very little debris. Now I'll explain this green tape here, why I've got this green tape in the background in a moment. But, and then, you know, you drill holes. Um, could you, could everyone please mute their microphone? I, not only do I mill the boards, but I drill the holes for the various through-hole components. And uh, here's uh, the first board I, I milled, you know, and I, I did a test board in different clearances. And uh, so I, I, I drilled down, uh, I milled down enough where I didn't remove a lot of FR4. And there was some areas where there was a little bit of extra copper left over and uh, that's probably because of a height map issue and I'll explain how that was fixed but you could see here I've got traces down to 0.25 millimeter trace and by default that's the trace width for in um, KiCad they mill at 0.25 millimeters and you could see here's a point uh, 405 SMD which is pretty small. I think that's too small to mill. And you know, you got SOIC and uh, 1206. 1206, perfectly doable. I do 1206 parts all the time and it comes out perfectly fine. So here's a summary of my CNC. So, Dave, how long does it take? Sorry? Dave, how long does it take to do that board? That one you showed? Oh, I. I don't know. I typically I'll mill a board and it may take sometimes six, eight hours. If I'm doing a complex board, I, I, a simple board may take 45 minutes. So it's still, you know, etching. If you look from end to end etching, if you're doing six hours to go and mill a board, end to end etching, you know, it's probably less than, than that to go and etch it, probably an hour or two. So etching is still, you know, quicker and cheaper to go and do, but you got to worry about, you know, uh, getting um, uh, the toner down. Now, the key thing here is is the errors I measured in the X, Y, and Z axis. Now, all I did was I gave it a jeep to move 200 millimeters and then I actually measured how much it moved and it was off by two millimeters. So that's two millimeters to 200 millimeters is 0.01. Now, ideally you should do this 10, 20, 50 times to get an average. And this back when I used to teach robotics and I used to teach the kids about robotics, uh, I would have the kids do that. They would move their robot, you know, 10, 12 times and they would measure the error in the robot moving say a meter or half a meter and they could calculate what the error is going to be so i just did one um run which is you know i was lazy but i should do more but the error is about 0.1 millimeter in the x-axis and it's about the same the y-axis again it's about 0.01 you know 0.07 i don't know one and uh, the z-axis, I'll show you on a, another slide how I measured the error there. Same thing. So you're getting about 0.01 millimeter accuracy on all three axes. Now there's uh, the bits you can get. I started out using a 30 degree V-bit, what's called a V-bit. I'll explain what that bit is in a, in a moment. And it's a 0.1 millimeter, uh, 30 degree V-bit. 
and you have to know what the width is. I will explain what that is in a moment. But this changes, and if you get this wrong, you will rip your board to crap. You have to know uh, how deep that bit's going and how much material that V bit's going to clear. And if you get that wrong, your bits, your board's going to look like crap. Okay, and so I started out doing 0.1 millimeter deep cuts and it left gaps. And if you go back to this slide, that's what uh, this slide here, because that was the 0.1 uh, millimeter depth plunging down and it left places. So based on the error in the z-axis, which is 0.01, I now plunge it to 0.11. And I do that extra one just to account for the error in the z-axis. And that seems to work fine. So uh, typically I do seven passes with a 40 degree overlap. I'll talk about that in a moment. And I run multiple jobs. So I'll run one job slow at a slow feed rate. And I got the definition of feed rate here. It's millimeters per minute. So it's 60 millimeters per minute. The head is going to move in the X, Y axis. And the Z is going to plunge down at 40 millimeters per minute. And at 40% overlap. And then I run a job at a 20% overlap and about four or five passes. And that seems like my height map, I do a spacing, I do a probe every eight, eight millimeters. And some of this will make sense when I talk later on, on a subsequent slide. So if you look at the height map, after doing a height map, you get this file here. And there's a bunch of numbers here for where the, I, I think the zero axis is and all some other stuff where home is and all that stuff. And um, these numbers are the pro probes. So here's three probes in one direction. I can't remember if that's the X. That's probably the X direction. And then it's got 10 probes in the Y. So in all, you got 30 points here mapped. So what I did, I ran this exact same height map three times. So here's from run one, run two, and run three. Then I looked at the, the average error in all three called, or the average difference between so the difference between these two between these two between these two between map one and map two map two and map three and map one and map three i i i calculated between the column one numbers and the column two and blah 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 then i took an average and if you look at the error regardless it's coming out around 0.01 if you round up Right, so it's coming out to be about 0.01. That's and that's where I got my Z. Uh, uh, accuracy. Is this tolerance important? Hey, hang on a second, Dave. 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 Yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave hang, hang on a sec. sec. Uh, uh, people, people have been putting, putting up their hands. hands. Do you want to ask? Do you want, do you want them to ask questions? questions? Yeah, yeah let's wait, wait till the let's, end. Let's wait until till the end because this is not long. Okay, let me just kind of blitz okay, through okay. these slides and then we could we can have a nice long discussion at the end. Okay, the reason I'm saying this is you got to see the forest from the, the trees. If you focus on just numbers for the sake of numbers, it's you're not going to get the results you want. So you have to take things in order of a magnitude. You can't just look at numbers as a number. Okay, so one of the key things is the clearances. Okay, so you when you're you have to mill the spacing between the pads. You have to clean that you have to isolate the pads. That's why they call it isolation routing. So you're going in and you're milling the material between these pads. So you gotta have enough passes to go and mill that stuff between there. You're not, the bit is so small, it can't just mill it in one pass. It's got to go through a bunch of passes and it's got to mill all that, that material away. So you, you got to isolate the, the pads, but you now the traces as well. You have to make sure that you have sufficient number of passes to get between the traces and remove all the copper between the traces. And same thing, the depth. If you look at the copper, you look at a FR4 board, this is a double-sided board, 
you've got copper at the top, you've got this fiberglass in the middle, they call that FR4, I believe. And so that thickness of it, here's a chart showing, you know, the different weights at one or one and a half ounce copper, you know, the thickness of that uh, copper is about 0.03 millimeters or 0.05 millimeters. It's around, you know, it's around 0.05-ish, 3-ish, 5-ish uh, millimeters. So when I mill down to 0.11 millimeters, I'm removing 0.07 millimeters of the FR4. Again, 4 is 0.07 millimeters. Do you know how small that is? That is small. So I'm not plunging. I am removing very, very little of that FR4 at 0.01, even 0.02 or 0.12 or 0.13 millimeters. I'm still removing very small amount of that FR4. So, and the key thing to keep in mind as you're milling these traces, look at, you need to know what the X and Y, Z axis is. It's still about 0.01 millimeters, so you're not going to be able to mill anything smaller than that. Because if you try and mill something smaller than that, chances are it's, you, there's going to be errors. Because the mill is not that accurate. So, V-bits. Sorry, you're going to have to know what math, you're going to have to, uh, so you're going to have to understand trig here. So this is a V-bit. It's basically a V. See the V? It's a V and it's got an angle. They measure the angle across in terms of uh, degrees. So this is like a 30 degree bit. So the angle from one to the other side, the inside angle is 30 degrees. Now if you zoom in at the tip, you might think it's a point, but it's not. It's, it's, a, it's got a cliff. It's got a, 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 an edge at the point and that's where the point one comes in so if you look at a bit you know you'll see the bit will say point one millimeters 30 degree bit that point one is that um, distance there that's very very important okay you need to understand what that width is and if you get that wrong then it's gonna your your accuracy your milling is gonna look like crap Okay, so basically, think of it like the thickness of, of uh, the uh, that's that's a limitation of of uh, the metal you're using the bit. So the reason we need to understand this stuff is when you plunge this bit of exaggerated here, the bit going below a surface. So let's let's pretend that's the copper, and uh, where it says surface, that white line's the copper. And below that is the FR4. So, you know, I'm exaggerating it here. So if you look at the depth of the cut, how far you're going to plunge that depth down is that deep. But as that bit is moving, it's clearing this distance away. And that distance is a function of your depth. So just because it's a 0.1 millimeter depth, it's not meaning it's going to move away point. Uh, 0 0.1 millimeters. Okay, it, it's going to move away. You have to know what that distance is, and that's where the uh, trig trigonometry uh, calculation comes in, right? So, the way you do this, it's a very simple calculation. Um, there's a hard way, and there's an easy way. I'm going to show you the hard way. So if you take these, these are two right angle triangles. If you separate the two right angle triangles and you say one triangle is 15 degrees, the other triangle is 15 degrees, you separate them and you say the thickness of my tip is 0.1 millimeters. So if I plunge it down a depth that deep, this, this plus the 0.1 plus that is going to be how much of that copper I'm going to mill away from the surface. So I should have used a different number. Um, my um, saying I'm plunging it down a depth of 0.1 millimeters, but the thickness is 0.1 millimeters. Those two numbers are totally, it just, for this, I just happen to pick the two numbers, same numbers. They don't have to be the same numbers. 
In actual fact, when I do my depth, I'm using 0.12 millimeters. But for this calculation, for some reason I use 0.1. So anyway, so if you look at this 15 degrees here, we need to know this side. This side's 0.1. This side is just 0.1 millimeters times the tangent of 15 degrees, which comes out to this 0.026 number here. So that number is the same as that number. So if you add this distance, which is 0.026, plus 0.1, plus 0.026 again, it comes out 0.1536. Now, in flat cam, they've got a V-shaped calculator where you put the tool tip diameter, you put the angle, you put the depth you're going to plunge it, and it tells you how much it's going to run. Sure enough, look, 0 0.1536, 0 0.1536. So that's how that works. Now, you've got the concept of passes. So one pass with the V-bit, it's going to move away 0.1536 millimeters of material off of the surface. And that's for it to plunge down 0.1 millimeters. Now, with a 40% overlap, this next pass, you're going to overlap the previous pass 40%. So 60% is going to be cut new, which is, you know, 60% of 0.1536 is 0.9215. So if you go to a third pass, the same thing again. You're now overlapping with the previous part, you know, 40%, 60% cut. So 60% uh, 0.9. Uh, you know, is being cut away new, and if you do that for n passes, and for example, for seven passes, you know, you're going to build away 0 0.7066 millimeters of uh, material. So that's why you need to do multiple passes, and you need to know how much overlap you're going to have, because this is going to tell you what how much material you're going to move away with seven passes. So, uh, so, how does the CNC work? So here's where we're going to have to understand a little bit about bits and chips. And I'm not talking about Ponge and Baker here. Um, so, key thing, first thing about bits, the wrong bits. These bits that come with the unit, these V-shaped bits, they are not for PCBs. If you look at the same smart PCB, chart and I've kind of merged these together. Here's the bits we typically get. These are the bits and they specifically say they're not for PCBs. So and I'll show you uh, why you would want to use these bits and what I have to do to make these bits work. But if you're going to buy bits you got to make sure you get the bits that specifically for Okay, and this is what happens. Okay, so here's three runs I did with the same bit, same depth, same same exact run. And as you look at it, you zoom in, you'll see each sub subsequent run, you'll see it just ripping the shit out of the copper. It's just ripping the crap out of the copper. And so, you know, the by the third bit, it just it just butchered the copper. So is that because of a cheap bit? Is it the wrong bit, a wrong setup? Is it the bit getting dull? What's going on? So eventually I had to chuck that bit out. And so, so this is where um, chip load and feed rate comes in, okay? So the, a chip is how much material your mill is gonna remove. That's what's called your chip size. It's kind of like a chisel. You know, when you chisel a piece of wood, there's a piece of wood chip that f flies off, except here. So chip load and feed rate. To calculate chip load, you need feed rate. And to calculate feed rate, you need chip load. This calculation drives me crazy. But typically, you get chip loads and feeds and speeds and all that stuff from CNC machines. Now, the bits we get, they're so cheap, they have none of this stuff published. So that's why you see a lot of people just doing trial and error. But the bottom line with these bits is if this bit gets too hot, it's going to dull. If the chip size is too big, it's going to dull. If the feed rate is too high, 
the bit's gonna dull. If the chip size is too small and your feed rate is too slow, the bit's gonna dull. The bottom line is your bit is gonna dull. End of story. So how do you combat that? And, uh, and I'll show you. Is I, uh, what I do, you slow down the rate, you run at low rate and you use lubrication, you use oil. And that saves your, your uh, bits and you get much, much better looking boards coming out. So here's an example. This, uh, that's what the green tape is down for because this board has oil and as it's milling, you got debris flying around and you've already seen this, this uh, video. So that's being milled and the board has got oil. And after it mills the board, it comes out really clear. And so this here was milled doing, um, it's not a pass, it's, a, it's an actual run. So, because you've got the concept of passes with overlaps, but these should be runs. This should not be a pass, this should be run. So it's a, you're running, you're doing a completely separate job. Okay, so I run, I do at least two runs. So I run it one time, oil surface, I go 0.1 millimeters deep and a feed rate of 50 millimeters and a plunge rate of uh, 30 millimeters, seven passes percent overlap. That's why I do my first run. My second run, uh, same depth, I go faster because the material is not cleared away. So my second run, I'm doing five passes at 25% overlap, and I'm just doing that to try and clear away any remnants left, left over. This is a cleaning pass. And if I find material still left, left over, I'll do a third run, but I'll plunge the, depth, the, the bit down to 0.12 millimeters, 0.1 millimeters, just to try and clear away the uh, debris. And so here you can see, here it is, three um, runs, you know, 20 degree, you know, two runs, first, same, exactly what, what I, uh, I discussed, lots of oil, and you can see the copper, remnant copper left over here, but it came out, it came out nice and clean, you know, each run, no dulling, the bit doesn't dull. And the same thing with uh, drilling holes. I do the same thing, I oil the surface. Here you can see the clip here. So remember I talked about a clip, you have to attach a clip to the copper, so when it's probing, it makes electrical connection. So that's a, I do for drilling, I use the, the height map, I use relation routing. Here's what I go, I'm not going through this, this is just I documented this, more so for my own. So if I have to go back, I know that uh, what I did to generate the boards. Here's how I generated the drilling. You know, I, I used different drills and how I set up the jobs. And so this is uh, coming to, to the end of the presentation now. So here's some finished products. So here's a board I milled. You know, it's a little bit blurry in places, but you could see it's nice, clean surface all the material those are 1206 smd pads you can see the holes being drilled that's that's for a um sma connector there and uh, the sma connector you can see nice tight drill holes the only thing i find with these small pads drilling holes um you need to clear away a little bit more clearance here because you'll get a solder bridge uh, here's some more finished boards this is the board held up to a light, so you could you could see the traces, how clean uh, the traces. Uh, some more boards, plated board here. With the toroids and uh, uh, fets. That's a power amp. Uh, here's another power amp uh, there, and. Here's some just some odds and ends of things, you know, how to set parameters. You know, one of the key things is that af after every job you do, you have to zero it. 
you have to make sure the job goes back to zero zero that way when you run a subsequent job it starts from zero zero and you need to program in there's a user command where you could program in where zero is so just in case you got to stop for the night and you got to come back to it this causes the mill to move to right where zero zero is so it could start the, the job there's a kill switch on the side here see I'm pointing to it when you're zeroing it or you're moving it because sometimes it doesn't hit the end and it'll go off and I've broken some of the limit switches because it just goes right to the edge and it breaks the limit switch so you know in, in this case it's supposed to zero zero here it doesn't and that's that's an issue with uh, sometimes in power on it just gets wonky and you got to reset it a couple of times this is how you set the home position this is just walking you through how you set the, the home position unless you've got a CNC machine this probably won't make sense to you another thing is that you got to make sure you center the bit in the collet if your bit is not centered this is what ends up happening you rip the shit out of the board yeah, I caught this too late and it just destroyed the board just going around and the board's totally useless it just because the bit had a little bit of a wobble like maybe a half a millimeter wobble in it and it just ripped the board to crap and this is just some g-code references here and default settings and that's it 